Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. I'm a software engineer at Figma. You can find me on social media at JLF Wong. And today, I want to take you on a bit of a journey. Before we can go on that journey, though, let's talk about the destination. So what are interactive components? Interactive components let you define prototype interactions between variants. So you can see here we have this button with a few interactions wired up between the different variants. Then you can make instances of those variants in your screen designs, set overrides on them, modify them however you'd like. And then when you use those screen designs in your prototypes, each one of those instances becomes interactive. And you can see that it's also preserving the overrides in these different states it's going through. Beyond these very simple examples of hover buttons, we made sure that we covered all of our base cases of checkboxes, that kind of functionality. But the simple primitives that we provided are also much more powerful than that. They allow you to explore very different interaction paradigms. So the example you're looking at here is a tic-tac-toe game that's part of the playground file that we provide to everyone to explore these different concepts. Even beyond interaction paradigms, you can also start to create these kind of like whimsical, fun experiences um, using very simple constructs in interactive components. If you want to try this out, please join the 40,000 people who are already in the closed beta. To do this, you can go to tinyurl.com slash interactive components. OK, so with that kind of destination in mind, now we can start to talk about the journey. So how did we get here? This journey kind of has these two different paths. There's these two parallel journeys that are going to be relevant. There's the product journey, and there's the engineering journey. These two different journeys have a few points where they kind of join up. We're going to be looking at this through the lens of prototyping, although a lot of the, the kind of ideas behind how we do these things at Figma are going to apply much more broadly. The first join up point is going to be prototyping. And then the second join point, which is the kind of core of this talk, is interactive components. So let's start with the product journey. Every team at Figma has a team charter. This is the kind of guiding light that we use to make hard decisions when we're trying to figure out what we should do. So for the prototyping team, that's to empower teams to quickly iterate on interactive ideas to find better, more innovative solutions earlier and faster. Though I actually like a slightly different version of this that was given to me by the designer on the prototyping team while I was making this talk. And what Nico said was, the goal of a design tool is to find the 900 wrong ideas faster. You might have seen Nico give a talk right before this uh, about some of these ideas of rapid iteration. And this is so, so true. I really like this description because it really emphasizes how powerful different explorations can be and how it really is about trying to explore all the things that don't work so that you can find the ones that do. With this in mind, we're going to repeatedly come back to this question of how can we reduce the cost of exploration? Anything that we can do in the tool through product and engineering means to reduce the cost of exploration is going to make Figma a more powerful tool for all of you. So, Let's start talking about this idea in the context of the product journey of prototyping. So one of the really core insights we had was that we could drive down the cost of exploration by allowing you to switch seamlessly between visual and interactive design in a single tool. Let's go through a simple example. Let's say that you've built this very simple application. You're designing a simple application that allows you to select a few different sounds and play them back. You've just finished the visual design, and you're filling in the copy. And now you want to be able to immediately experiment with different potential user flows. From here, you can start to wire up these different prototype interactions. So what this is doing is specifying when you click in different regions of the screen where it should go. And this is all being done in the same tool that you did the drawing and the copy editing. From there, if you click the Play button, that's always available in the top right of Figma documents, you can immediately start interacting with the prototype. And it might be that some things that weren't apparent from looking at just the purely visual design are now apparent from the interactive version. You might decide, like, wait a minute, maybe I don't need this 
intermediate screen that has the play button. Maybe when you click on the, the sound, it should just go directly to playing. And when you stop, it should just return you to the original screen. And you can experiment with those ideas immediately. Play again. You can just switch back to the tab that was already open. And you can immediately see the result of this. Well, now you might say, like, OK, well, that, I think that idea is working. But now I want to go back and, and tweak certain parts of the visual design. If the Figma, if designing the visual design and interactive design were in two different tools, in the middle of these two steps, you'd have to export and re-import between two separate tools, which would be really, really frustrating. That would really increase the cost of exploration. Now, with all these changes made in a single tool, we can immediately see the composition of these changes to interactive design and visual design. Once we had the, the base of prototyping in Figma, we knew that we needed to expand its power. And one of the first things we added, this is still back in 2018, so quite a long time ago, was transitions. So we wanted to be able to empower people to experiment not only with visual design, not only with the user flow, but exactly what was happening during those transition points. So here you can see that we have a two-screen design where clicking on the sign-in button brings you from the left screen to the right screen. And you can experiment very easily with trying different animation strategies to switch between those two screens. So here what we're doing is we're reducing the cost of exploration by allowing you to experiment with basic in animations all within the single tool. So again, we're trying to cut out as much as we can any need to export into other tools to allow you to be as efficient as possible to explore the most wrong ideas as quickly as you can. So another way in which we can really reduce the cost of exploration, rather than creating more power, we can also allow simpler constructs to avoid needing to duplicate things. To understand what I mean here, let's look at an example. So imagine we have this application design with this very common UI paradigm of having this menu that comes in from the side. There's three different pages here. There's a new file screen, there's a notification screen, and an images screen. And we want to be able to pull up that menu from any one of those screens. Before we added any specific affordances for this, you could have done this, but it would have been pretty annoying. You would have had to, for each screen, make a full copy of that screen that had a copy of this menu. If you wanted to experiment with moving the position of that menu, you'd have to select all three copies of it. If you wanted to add another screen, you'd have to add two copies of that screen, one without the menu and one with. And this is the kind of thing that can really introduce friction into the design process. So instead of that, we introduced this feature of overlays. So now you can see that there's only a single copy of this menu. By only having a single copy, it means that these different ideas for how this might work are going to become cheaper to explore. So this reduces the cost of exploration by removing the duplication needed to express these simple concept of overlays. Overlays can be used for menus. They can be used for alerts. They can be used for tooltips. They have many different use cases, each of which, without this feature, would be much more expensive to explore. The next kind of point on this journey where we really started to, to really ramp up the power of Figma's animation engine was with Smart Animate. So this is a fairly common kind of UI paradigm of having a list uh, on mobile where you interact with it by swiping on the list item. And then you can click a delete item and have it cleared. So we really want to enable people to explore these more detailed animation ideas still in Figma. And we want to allow people to do that as simply as possible. One mechanism for doing that is Smart Animate. So what Smart Animate lets you do is define each one of these screens that just show the, the intermediate points of what they should look like. And then the animation engine will intelligently figure out how to animate from one state to the next. So that entire complex animation is expressed just with these five screens in Figma. And again, this is all staying within one tool. Previously, if you want to explore this, you would have had to export to a different tool. And that, again, brings in this friction. So here, we're going to reduce the cost of exploration by allowing you to explore granular animations without leaving Figma. That brings us up to the, the title of the talk, Interactive Components. And we're going to explore the same idea of how we can reduce the cost of exploration. One of the ways we do this with interactive components is allowing you to wire once and use everywhere. To understand what that means, let's look at an example. So you can imagine this kind of from 
the footer of some website, or really anywhere where you need to have a list of links. This one is taken directly from Figma's own marketing page footer. This kind of interaction is so simple and so common on the web. And yet, previously, this kind of thing can be a real big pain to try to actually implement in a design tool. So here we have each one of these things hovered over. We just wanted to have an underline. That's it. Before we had any specific affordances for this kind of thing, the most obvious way of implementing this is actually to have a full copy of the screen where the only thing different on each of these screens is the underline, and then specify for hovering on each of those different things to, uh, to navigate to the screen that has the underline. This is a big pain. If you wanted to change spacing, this would be frustrating. If you wanted to add another link, this would be frustrating. All of these things are going to make you much less open to experimenting and finding those 900 wrong ideas. So instead, you might settle on something that you're not super happy with. We can improve on this a little bit using overlays by making it so that you don't need full copies of each of the screens. So here, instead, we just have copies of each of the text with the underline, and then we use each of those as overlays. This is still pretty annoying, though. I mean, if you wanted to change um, animation properties for exactly what happens when you hover, or if you wanted to change different facets of the hover state, each one of these things would be really frustrating. Also, adding another link means adding two copies and this prototype link. Instead, we can do much better than this. With interactive components, we can wire up this single thing where this is the resting state, this is the hover state, and then use instances of that in the design. Then when you hover over them, it'll add the underline. So you only need to drag in the, the link, change the text one time, and then everything should just work. So the, another mechanism which we can reduce the, the amount of overhead that it takes you to explore different ideas is removing duplication needed to retain state. So state here, there's lots of different meanings of state, but let's look at an example where we kind of talk about a specific version of that. So imagine you're trying to create this design. Very simple, three check boxes. How hard could this be, right? Well, before interruption components, the answer is this is a big pain. It would require something like this, which is really unfortunate. What's happening here is in order to explore what these three checkboxes would look like in a way that all the checkboxes actually work, you would need to draw out every single combination of checkbox values and then meticulously wire up each individual pair to make sure that all the toggles do the thing that you want. After making this, I'm not even sure this version is correct because testing out all the possible combinations is a big pain. With interactive components, we can do much, much better. Here, we have a single checkbox that just toggles when you click on it, and then use instances of that interactive component in the design, and then all the checkboxes should just work. OK, so hopefully that's given you some sense of, of the, the product goal here and why we're moving in that direction. Repeatedly trying to think about this idea of how can we make experimentation as easy as possible for designers. Now. We're going to start to dig a little bit into the engineering portions of this. And if you've worked much in browsers, if you've worked in HTML and CSS, you might be thinking, OK, this doesn't seem so hard. I've done this kind of thing in the past. If I wanted to make like a fancy hover state, it's not that bad in HTML and CSS. You should define some buttons. You define the properties of the active state and the resting state. And then you can even ask the browser to specify how to animate this thing. All you have to do is specify a transition property. So this is not very much code. You would expect this to be very, very simple for Figma to implement. And to understand why it's not, we need to go a bit on the engineering journey. So let's talk about the path we got here along the engineering side of this journey. Still, even in the context of engineering, we're going to stay grounded in this question of how do we reduce the cost of exploration? How do we make sure? that our tool is the absolute best one for experimenting with different ideas. One of the really crucial decisions that we made for this back in 2013 was to use WebGL for our, our rendering. Now, I joined in 2016, so this is me being a bit of a historian and trying to talk to lots of people to understand these decisions. Um, but I have worked quite a lot in WebGL, so I do have a pretty visceral understanding of why this is important. WebGL is a technology that allows browsers, allows uh, people writing code inside of browsers to use the graphics card. So this is 
the portion of your computer that's really, really good at drawing stuff and dealing with graphics really, really efficiently. Seems like the right tool for the job. The alternative would have been to use some combination of HTML, SVG, and CSS. The way that we're going to make sure that we keep the cost of exploration low here is by making sure that rendering is always responsive. When you make a change, in order for you to know whether it's the right thing or not, you need to be able to experience it. And to experience it, you need to see it. To, to see the changes you're visually making, we need to therefore make sure that rendering is always kept up to date as quickly as possible. To understand why WebGL facilitates this, let's look at what would happen if we use SVG and CSS instead. So for this demo, what I did was I took a real design from a real Figma project. So this is actually the design file for interactive components itself. This is where we experiment with different ideas for how we might implement interactive components. And this is showing it zooming in and out. So this is going to be a little bit hard to understand through the video stream. But hopefully, even through the video stream, you can see that this is really, really choppy. What's happening here is the entire document is a single SVG. And then we're transforming with a CSS transform property. So the zooming in and out is a change of the transform. This is running at about three frames per second, which is about 300 milliseconds per frame. This is way too slow for the tool to feel good. If you're a little bit clever, which is what some tools do do, you can do better than this by using the special will change property in CSS. If you do this, it's telling the browser, hey, don't re-render this thing immediately. Like I'm going to change this thing. So just stretch up and down the image that you've already rendered. The problem with that is it's really blurry. And then the second problem with this is after you're done zooming, it still needs to re-render, and it's still going to re-render everything. And that still leads to these really long hitches. So a hitch here just means that the entire tool is going to lock up for about 300 milliseconds. And that also starts to feel like friction. Any kind of friction in your tool is going to result in you exploring fewer ideas because you're going to get frustrated. And honestly, it just eats into your time. With these two kind of examples, hopefully fresh in your mind of what this looks like, I'd like to show you what this looks like in Figma. So here is what rendering the same exact document looks like in Figma. This is running at 60 frames per second and 60 milliseconds per frame. So this is in part because our renderer is really fast, but it's also because we have really, really careful control of exactly how and when we render. If we want to increase the resolution of something, we can do that whenever we want. If we realize that we are at what's called our frame budget, we can stop. And then we can make sure that we allocate enough time to respond to user input and to draw the things that we know you need to see in order to understand what's going on with your design. Another really core part of Figma's performance story is the use of C++. C++ is a high performance programming language. It's used very commonly in video games. And actually, the architecture of video games is one of the biggest inspiration in how Figma is built. So the goal here is, again, trying to reduce the cost of exploration. And we want to make all operations as fast as possible. So this isn't just about rendering. This isn't just about panning and zooming. This is also about things like editing, changing colors, dragging things around, all of these really, really crucial operations that as soon as they start to slow you down, you really feel the pain. So. You might be wondering, wait a minute, Like, how do you run C++ in a browser? I thought that the only language that you could use in the browser was JavaScript. And it's kind of true, or it was for a long time. So there was this project, um, even before 2014, called Mscripten. And Mscripten was kind of this bizarre project that allowed you to take C++ code and then compile it into JavaScript. Now, you might be wondering, like, wait, wait a minute. like. You just said that the reason you chose C++ was in part for performance. But then you're saying that it generates JavaScript. So isn't it going to be slow just as JavaScript would be here? And the answer is like, well, not quite. So it doesn't compile to normal JavaScript. It compiles into this thing called ASM.js. So ASM.js is this, this subset of JavaScript that's, that's very tightly constrained into only things that can be done very, very efficiently. To give you an example of how different the JavaScript you might write by hand is versus the JavaScript generated by mscripten going from C++, here's a simple function that takes uh, a list of numbers and then adds them all up. 
So this is what a JavaScript might look like if you wrote up a hand. And here's what it would look like if you took some C++ code and then generated the resulting ASM.js. So this is going to be very, very efficiently running code, uh, but it's very different than how you might write, write it by hand. This also means that we have much more careful control of things like exactly how and when we allocate memory. The next kind of piece in this puzzle was figuring out what to do for mobile. We knew early on that at Figma, we wanted people to be able to view their documents not only on their laptops, on their desktops, but also on their phones. This is also really important for feedback loops. If I just finished up some design and I wanted some feedback for it, I might send it to a PM or another member of the team. And they might be in a coffee shop. They might be on the bus. They might be on the subway. And I'd like to get feedback from them as early as I can. And if they're on their phone, then that means that they need to open Figma files on their phone. Now, the first thing we tried here had some problems. If we take the code that we used in the editor, and then we just loaded that as the, this ASMJS giant amount of JavaScript, that would be very, very slow to load. It took about 30 seconds to load even very, very simple files on mobile. To understand why, we need to draw a distinction here between small code and fast, and fast code. I just said earlier that one of the reasons that we chose C++ is that it's very fast. So why are we having this problem where it's slow on mobile? And the answer is the code that we're generating from the C++, the JavaScript that we were generating from the C++, was very optimized to run very quickly once it had loaded, once it had started up. But the startup cost could be quite high. And this was particularly bad for mobile devices in 2015. What we needed here was not just code that was really fast once it booted up, but we needed code that was very small, very compact, that would run very quickly on boot. So thankfully, at the time, uh, one of Figma's co-founders, Evan Wallace, was working on a project to help exactly this kind of use case. He was working on his own programming language. This programming language is called SKU. It's a web-first, cross-platform programming language with an optimized compiler. That's a lot of jargon. You don't have to worry too much about what the specifics of that mean. The really key part here is that SKU is a language that's very similar to JavaScript, very similar to TypeScript, which can generate very, very compact JavaScript code that can then boot very, very quickly on mobile. The result of this is that we now had these two separate code bases. We had the editor code base. So this is the code base you use all the time when editing Figma files. And then we had this viewer code base. And this is the one that was used all the time when you're loading files on mobile. And these are powered now by two different code bases, two different languages. The left, C++, the right, SKU. And they're optimized for different things. The editor is optimized for once it boots up to run as fast as possible. And the viewer was optimized for when uh, to, to boot up as fast as possible, because we definitely want to make sure you wait the minimal time you can once you click on that link on your phone. The, the difference in the kind of code generated here was not a subtle distinction. The code generated from the editor after compression, so this is the amount you have to download onto your phone, was about 2 megabytes for the editor, and it was about 100 kilobytes for the viewer. So this is a really dramatic difference. And that dramatic difference translated very directly into performance changes. The editor would take on, this is on mobile specifically, on mobile, the editor would take about 30 seconds to load a file, whereas the viewer would take only five. And the experiential difference between those is dramatic. We had to keep these decisions in mind back in 2017 now when we introduced prototyping. So we again had these two separate code bases to consider. And we had to decide which one of these are we going to build our prototyping functionality on top of. When you actually go to play the prototype, which code base is going to be the one that's relevant? We knew early on that it was going to be very important to be able to play back prototypes both on desktop and on mobile. So to do that, we, we really wanted to have a single code base that was powering this. Ultimately, what we decided to do here, because these things need to load very quickly on mobile, is that we decided to have this powered by SKU. So this is powered by the same viewer code base as we load other files on mobile. The next kind of crucial evolution was WebAssembly. So earlier when I was saying, how do we run C++ in the browser, the answer was this thing called ASM.js. And the people who designed ASM.js fairly early on had a grander vision. What if you didn't have to go through JavaScript at all? What if there was another way of executing code in the browser 
that was specifically designed to make running native code, C++ code, very, very efficiently. And that's what they did. They came up with this standard called WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a binary format rather than a text format for the storage and execution of code. We adopted this technology as early as we could because this really aligned with our goal of reducing the cost of exploration because this makes all the operations we've written in C++ even faster. In some cases, the effects of this were pretty dramatic. We were able to significantly reduce the load time. This is a benchmark from, from quite a long time ago in Firefox. Since then, many, many different browsers, WebAssembly engines have been very, very optimized. But even then, the difference between running the ASM.js code and the WebAssembly code was dramatic. We were seeing to two to three times improvements as a result of this. The other crucial thing here that's going to become relevant in a little while is that this stuff works pretty well on mobile. OK, so now we've gone through the entire product journey, and then we're just reaching interact components on the engineering journey. We know where we're trying to get, get to. We know what all the constraints are. So let's go do this thing. The two things to keep in mind for this, to understand the challenges we face. We use WebGL to render for our prototypes, not HTML and CSS. And then we have these two separate code bases. We have the C++ code base powering the editor, and we have the SKU code base powering the prototyping view. Now, one of the core questions that we need to answer, which sounds really simple, but I'll hopefully be able to explain why this is pretty tricky uh, in order to make interactive components work, is how do we keep the button text correct when you press on them? This seems like a silly question. Let's look at an example. So on the left-hand side here, we have what you would see in the editor. In the editor here, we have an interactive component representing this button with an active press state. And then we have an instance of that button in the design. Now, the important thing to notice here is that the instance has an override. The text of this is overwritten. Instead of saying button, it says press me. And then in the viewer, you can see that exactly as you'd expect. When you press the button, it turns into the press me text. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take the font information from the pressed state, but the text information, the string, from the the instance that's in the design. And again, to keep in mind this divide and how this has worked in the past, the editor thing on the left, powered by C++, the prototype viewer on the right, powered by SKU, these code bases are separate. And they have different capabilities because we've used them for very different things at different times. The editor has been used for all the core editing use cases, and it means that it needs to support text layout, it needs to support auto layout, where it hasn't needed to support animation, whereas the viewer supports animation but doesn't support text layout and auto layout. Now, you may say, OK, wait, 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 wait. What, what do you mean it doesn't support text layout? The thing I'm showing you right now is a Figma prototype. This whole slideshow is a Figma prototype, and we're looking at some text. So how is it possible that text doesn't work for prototypes? The answer is it kind of cheats. The way it cheats is the editor is always the thing doing text layout. Whenever you do any kind of editing operation in the editor involving text, the editor will use the, the appropriate font file. Again, remember that we're not using HTML and CSS for rendering here, so we do all of our own text layout as well. The C++ code is loading the font. It's taking the, the string of the text involved in a certain block of text, and then it's laying it out character by character. And then what it's doing is actually baking that file, they start baking that visual information into the file. So it's, it's sending it to the multiplayer server. The multiplayer server is how we do real-time collaboration and storing that cache data. It's storing the information about how each of these characters should be laid out one after each other. Then the viewer can read that cache data, and that's how it's able to present that text. The problem is this press me text, this version with the font from the pressed state, but the text from the instance never occurred anywhere in the editor. So how can it get the cache data if the cache data was never written? The editor never knew it needed to write this. One way of solving this problem that we considered was to have the editor go through every possible different state a button or really any kind of interactive component could be in, try all of them, and then write cache data for all of them into the file. The problem with this is that this can, the problem with this is that this can actually result in an explosion in the number of possible states which could then cause some significant slowdowns in the editor. 
Since our whole goal is trying to make explore exploration cheap, we realized this was not a viable solution. So we do instead, we have these two different code bases now both existing in the prototype view. This was a pretty major architectural evolution for us. Now we have both the SKU code base and the C++ code base working in tandem when you play back prototypes. So the SKU code base will do the swap. It'll tell the C++ code base, hey, please perform this swap. It'll get the text data back and then you can display that data. This architectural shift was a really, really core part of what it took on the engineering side to deliver this feature. And this now works. Even for very complex components with many possible different reachable states, this solution scales and works very effectively. This is also the reason we have this checkbox here. So this, this little text here saying that disabling interactive components improves prototype load times, that's because we have a lot of rough edges from this architectural change. This is why we're in closed beta. We wanted to give, it, give access to this feature as early as we could without exposing everyone who didn't yet, not yet need it to the rough edges. We're working on a fix for this. This architectural evolution is in the early days, and we have ideas for how to evolve past this. So where are we now? Well, we've gone through these two journeys now. We've arrived at interactive components, and we're now in a closed beta. As a reminder, if you want to try this out, go to tinyurl.com slash interactive dash components. The open beta is going to come soon. I don't have dates yet, but these are the two things that we're really working hard on. Working on proving performance, both load time and playback. And then we're also working on better auto layout support for interactive components specifically. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. Uh, my name is Jamie Wong. You can find me at JLF Wong on Twitter and uh, the Figma design community. And I hope you really enjoyed the rest of this conference. Thank you.